Starting at number 10, we have the first revelation of the Quran. This one is actually pretty cool. So Prophet Muhammad, he spent a lot of his time in prayer and meditation, you know, just getting his mind focused on God and what he has to do in his day-to-day -day life. And one of these times that he was praying and meditation, he received his first revelation of the Quran from God. Muslims know this as the night of power. Muhammad was meditating in a cave on Mount Hira when he saw the angel Jibril, also known as angel Gabriel, and the angel commanded him to recite the words, and the words are recorded actually in the Quran, and it goes as follows. Read in the name of your Lord who created, created man from a clinging substance. Read, and your Lord is the most generous who taught by the pen, taught man what he did not know. And specifically, that's found in the Quran, Surah 96, verses 1 to 5. Now, the next surprising story is the splitting of the moon. So, way back then, the polytheists at the time of the Prophet, they kept on insisting that they wanted to see a miracle. They were demanding one. And they said that they're going to believe in the Prophet Muhammad's message if he could show them a sign by splitting the moon in half. So when God granted the Prophet Muhammad the ability to do so, he called a polytheist to take a look and the moon was actually split in two. But, you know, they still rejected his message, even though they said that if they saw a sign like that, they would believe. Now, moving on to the story at number eight, we have the Prophet Muhammad's chest opening. Okay, guys, so Prophet Muhammad, he stayed with the tribe of Bani Saad until he was about four years old. And that was when his chest was split open. What am I talking about? It's actually been reported in the Hadith that... When Prophet Muhammad was playing with two boys, Jibril came and took Prophet Muhammad away, split open his chest, and took out his heart. Jibril then took a lump out of the Prophet Muhammad's heart and said, This is your portion of Satan. Next, he washed Prophet Muhammad's heart with Zamzam water in a gold container. After that, Prophet Muhammad's heart was joined together and restored to its place in his chest. Prophet Muhammad's face had changed color. Also, Anas, who narrated this hadith, he added this, I saw the mark of the thread of Prophet Muhammad's chest. And this is in reference to the part where his heart was taken out and closed back up. And as he got older, that mark still was there on his chest. The story at number seven involves Prophet Muhammad becoming invisible. When the Prophet Muhammad planned to migrate to Medina, the tribes of Mecca, they came up with this plan to kill him. Now, each tribe, they sent a representative and they surrounded the house where Prophet Muhammad was one night. But Muhammad, he actually just walked out in front of them and nobody saw him. They were completely blinded to him. It was a very miraculous event. Moving on to the story at number six. So once the Prophet Muhammad was with around 300 of his companions and the place that they were gathered was a place called Zara. Then the time of the afternoon prayer came, but the people, they didn't find anywhere to wash themselves. So the Prophet told them to take a look and see if they can find a little bit of water. So they found a little bit of water and then he dipped his hands into it and out of his hand started flowing fountains of water. All 300 people, they were able to wash themselves so that they were able to perform their prayer. Halfway in at number five, let's look at the story of the horse and the sand and the assassin. So the Prophet Muhammad and Abu Bakr, they were on their way to Medina when they were being followed by an assassin named Suraka. So Abu Bakr began to get a little bit scared, but the Prophet Muhammad looked at him and said, don't be sad, Allah is certainly with us. Then he looked towards the assassin named Suraka and his horse's feet actually started to get stuck in the sand and he started to sink. And Suraka was able to, you know, free up himself, free the horse as well. And then he tried to continue following the Prophet Muhammad and Abu Bakr again. But then his horse's legs got stuck another time and then smoke started coming out of the sand. And when he saw this, Suraka was like, okay, I'm not messing with this guy anymore. This is definitely something up. He's definitely protected by God. So he ended up turning back 
and uh, Prophet Muhammad and Abu Bakr were spared. Moving on to the story at number four, we have the marriage to Aisha. This is one of the most controversial stories involving Prophet Muhammad. But either way, Lady Aisha, she was a noble daughter of Abu Bakr, who was the father-in-law of Prophet Muhammad. And she was much younger than Prophet Muhammad. And that's the thing that is very controversial for a lot of people. Now, there was one time where the Prophet Muhammad was asked by his companions about the most beloved person to him. And he answered saying, Aisha. And then they said, okay, well, what about the most beloved person to you from among men? And he said, her father, Abu Bakr. The marriage of Prophet Muhammad to Lady Aisha, it was based on a divine command as Lady Aisha narrated that angel Jibril or Gabriel came to the Prophet Muhammad carrying a green silk cloth with her image on it and said, this is your wife in this world and in the hereafter. And this is found in the Hadith Al-Tirmidhi. Number three brings us the time where Prophet Muhammad actually saw a jinn. So in some of the Hadith and the Quran, it actually mentions that Prophet Muhammad saw and spoke with the jinn. Abu Huraira narrates in the Hadith that the Prophet Muhammad said, I saw a demon of the jinn at the night of Miraj, which is ascension. And he was following me with a torch of fire in his hand. I saw him at my every glance. And then Gabriel said, I can teach you a prayer if you like. When you read it, his torch will fade away and he will fall down onto his mouth. The prophet said, okay. Gabriel said, read this. I take refuge in Allah from wickedness descending from the sky and ascending to the sky. The wickedness created on the earth and the wickedness coming out of the earth, from disorders of the day and night, from troubles that arisen during the day and night for the sake of Allah and his perfect words. O oh, merciful, accept the things that bring goodness. Also, the Quran mentions that a group of jinn came to the Prophet. They listened to the Quran being recited, they believed him, and they went back to their jinn community and advised them to also accept this message. And by the way, the reference to this is found in Surah 72 verses 1. Number two leads us to the Battle of Badr. This is a major event in Muslim history. The Battle of Badr happened around 624 CE and it was a major military victory led by the Prophet Muhammad that marked a turning point for the early Muslim community or Ummah from a defensive standpoint towards one of stability and expansion and offense. It boosted the morale of the Ummah like crazy. It has great significance due to the fact that it is also mentioned in the Holy Quran. As a matter of fact, it's the only battle mentioned in the Quran. The victory of Badr was so important for growing the Muslim community that it was believed to be miraculous. This victory confirmed the divine nature of the new religion of Islam to the Ummah, and the Quran says the victory was because of divine intervention. It goes as follows, Indeed, Allah made you victorious at Badr when you were vastly outnumbered. So be mindful of Allah, perhaps you will be grateful. And that's taken from Surah 3 verses 123. And the final story we end off on is a story of Isra and Mihraj. The Isra and the Mihraj refer to two parts of a miraculous journey that the Prophet Muhammad took in one night from Mecca to Jerusalem and then the ascension up into the heavens. The journey is believed to have taken place over a year before the Prophet Muhammad migrated from Mecca to Medina. And on this journey, he met prophets of old like Moses and Jesus and Abraham and many others. He also was able to lead them in prayer and he ascended to a point that was so close to the presence of God that he could actually hear the pens writing people's deeds. And this is something that happens in the presence of God. He saw heaven and hell and he was elevated into the presence of God, but he of course did not see God's face at all. One. Number 10 brings us speaking with jinn. In one Islamic narration, a jinn called Hama came in the form of an old man that was holding a staff and he was somebody who actually accepted Islam. And by the way, he was the son of Him, the son of Lakhis, the son of Iblis. He was converted to Islam by the Prophet Noah and he lived all the way up until the time of Prophet Muhammad. 
very unique experience. Number nine brings us becoming invisible. When the Prophet planned to migrate to Medina, the tribes in Mecca, they came up with a plan to get rid of him for good. Each tribe, they sent a representative and they surrounded the house of the Prophet on that night. But Muhammad, he just walked out right in front of them and nobody saw him at all. They were completely blinded to him. Another miraculous event of Prophet Muhammad was the horse in the sand incident. The Prophet Muhammad and Abu Bakr, they were on their way to Medina when they were being followed by an assassin named Suraka. And Abu Bakr, he started to get a little bit worried and a bit fearful, but Muhammad looked at him and said this, don't be sad, Allah is certainly with us. Then from there, he looked towards the assassin, Suraka, and his horse's feet started to get stuck in the sand. And Suraka initially was able to free his horse's feet from the sand and from getting stuck. But when he tried to continue to follow the Prophet Muhammad, well, his horse's leg got stuck again and smoke started coming out of the sand. And that's when Suraka realized that, yeah, he did not stand a chance. So he had to turn back and go where he came from. The miracle at number seven has to do with water flowing from Muhammad's hands. There was a time when the Prophet Muhammad was with around 300 of his companions and they're in a place called Zara. And the time of the day was about the time for the afternoon prayer, but the people, they couldn't find any water to make wudu or wash themselves. And the Prophet Muhammad, he told them to look for just a little bit of water, just a little bit. And when they found that, then he dipped his hand into it and that's when water started to flow from his hands like a fountain. And all 300 people there made wudu, so they were able to wash themselves, as well as they could use the water for other purposes. Number six brings us healing sick people. In one Islamic narration, one of the Prophet's companions was hit with an arrow in the eye. Ouch! Now the arrow was so deep that it went through the back of his head. But Muhammad simply placed his hands over his companion's eye and everything was healed, just like that. The miracle halfway in at number five is food increase. So the Prophet Muhammad, he actually fed more than 100 people from very small amounts of food. Whenever he placed his hands on any food, it caused it to increase and everyone could eat till their stomachs were filled, as well as their foods left over. And in one narration, he fed more than 100 men from a cup of milk. Each person was able to drink milk until they were filled and actually they didn't have to refill the cup at all. Each of the men, they drank to their satisfaction and the cup still was filled with milk as if nobody drank from it. So imagine seeing that mind blowing. Now, this is a big event coming in at number four, the Isra and Miraj. This was very miraculous. Known in English as the Night of Journey and Ascension, this is reported to be one of the most amazing miracles of the Prophet. It's called Al Isra Wal Miraj in Arabic. And this was a night where the Prophet Muhammad, under the guidance of the Archangel Jibril, traveled to Kaaba in Mecca to Al Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem and then up into the heavens. And on this journey, it was pretty phenomenal. He met some prophets of old. He met prophets like Musa or Moses, Isa, also known as Jesus, and Ibrahim, also known as Abraham. He led them in prayer and he reached a very high place where he could even hear the pens that were writing people's good deeds or bad deeds. He also was able to see heaven and hell and he was elevated into the presence of God but he, of course, was not able to see God's face at all. The miracle at number three is the Prophet Muhammad communicating with objects. There's been reports of several occasions where trees and stones and mountains and even the sand would actually acknowledge the Prophet when he passed by. But there was one incident where one Jewish woman, she was roasting a goat and it was filled with a very strong poison. So she sent it to the Prophet Muhammad and the people with him to eat it. But before the Prophet ate, the goat spoke to him, the roasted goat, yeah, spoke to him and told him that there's poison here, so don't be eaten. So Prophet Muhammad was able to 
avoid eating the poisonous food as well as warn the people with him to not eat. Miracle number two is splitting the moon. So the polytheists at the time of the prophet, they kept insisting that they wanted to see a miracle. They wanted to see a sign. And they said that they will believe if the prophet could actually show them the splitting of the moon in half. So when Allah granted the Prophet Muhammad this ability, he called them all to one place to witness this. And that's what he did. He split the moon in two. But in their arrogance, they still rejected him and his message. Now the miracle at number one, some of you probably guessed it, but it's simply the miracle of the Quran. There's a claim in the Quran itself that no one can actually imitate the Quran because it's perfect and its quality is above any other. It's a very superior book, a very superior recitation. It was revealed fully in Arabic, Prophet Muhammad's mother tongue, and it's believed by Muslims to have all the answers of life and all the instructions and directions to live a life on the right path that leads to heaven. Muslims also believe that the Quran is the verbatim word of God. And this is why it's set apart from any other book on the planet and even throughout history. So this is why the Quran comes in at number one in this episode. Okay, so starting off with this episode, at number 10, we have sadaqa. Sadaqa means to give gifts. Also, there's another legal charitable giving where the term zakat is used. Now, zakat has also been called sadaqa because it's also a kind of compulsory charity in a sense. And the Prophet Muhammad was also known for performing sadaqa. He regularly gave to the poor and it's recorded in the hadith that he said this. He is not a Muslim whose stomach is full while his neighbors go hungry. Smiling is another tradition of the Prophet Muhammad and we find this over in the hadith that was narrated by Abdullah ibn Harith and he said these words, I've never came across a person who smiled as much as Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad regarded smiling to a brother as an act of charity. So yeah, it kind of links to point number 10 that I talked about, like giving. Smiling is a gift, you know, because when we smile at people, it allows people to just connect with you easier, as well as sometimes that's all it takes to put somebody in a better mood, to just flash a smile. Next up at number eight, this one is, I think, something that is becoming a lot more popular now because of the benefits that people in general are finding, but self-reflection. And this is something that Prophet Muhammad had a tradition of doing. He used to go to the cave of Hira to seclude himself and really meditate and focus on himself. This tradition, it really helps somebody just like really connect with who they are, connect with their purpose, regardless of if you're a Muslim or not, you can still connect to whatever you see that higher power as. And yeah, personally, I think it's really important to do this because sometimes you can get kind of lost in just everything that's going on and you're kind of like, oh, what am I doing here? What am I supposed to be doing? Who am I even? Take that time to self-reflect, stay focused. Dental hygiene, I hope this is a tradition that everybody is taking seriously, but the Prophet Muhammad definitely did. He would always brush his teeth using miswak, which is a teeth cleaning twig. Also in the Hadith, it was recorded that the Prophet Muhammad said this, make a regular practice of miswak, for verily it is the purification for the mouth and a means of pleasure of the Lord. He also recommended just hygiene in general. But yeah, when it comes to dental hygiene, don't just stop at your teeth. There's also your gums, your tongue, your whole mouth. You know, use some mouthwash, you know, rinse that bad boy. Next up, we have the tradition of drinking water slowly. So today, science actually claims that drinking water at once can actually cause headaches as well as imbalance in the blood electrolyte. There's also some other conditions linked with it, so don't just be gulping down water. Take time. This was a tradition of Prophet Muhammad. In the Hadith, it says these words, do not drink in one gulp like a camel, but in two or three gulps. Mention the name of Allah when you start drinking and praise him after you have finished drinking. The tradition at number five is waking up early. This is a big one, definitely. Prophet Muhammad had a tradition of this. He would wake up early for the morning prayers. And you know, being an early riser is actually scientifically linked 
linked to better productivity. I know it may not seem that way, but definitely there is some benefits there, even if it's just 15 minutes earlier. Plus, who wants to sleep all day anyways? Yes, I know sleeping is so good, but there's so much to do in the day. Like, <sighs> I don't know. Either way, let's move on to number four. We have the tradition of fasting. Fasting was another regular tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, but he didn't just fast during the month of Ramadan. As many of you know, if you're Muslim, of course, you know the month of Ramadan, but for those who don't, Ramadan is the month of fasting. But Prophet Muhammad would fast at different times. It's similar to intermittent fasting, and apparently there is some benefits, like it helps balance your hormone levels as well as reduces inflammation in your body. In the Hadith, this passage is recorded. The Messenger of Allah was keen to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. We talked about sleeping, but uh, number three here is not sleeping on the stomach. I know it's one of my favorite sleeping positions, but definitely there is some negative sides to it because of the, your weight of your body. It can really affect your spine as well as other internal organs. And that's why some medical professionals will even tell you that you shouldn't have your child sleeping on their stomach, maybe like a little bit on the side. But either way, in the Hadith, it said that the Messenger of Allah came out in the night to check up on his guest and saw me lying on my stomach. He prodded me with his foot and said, do not lie in this manner for it is a way of lying that Allah hates. Let's talk about dates at number two, the food dates. Like they're actually really, really, really good. I love using them in my oatmeal and my cereals and all of that. It's also the perfect food to break your fast because it really stabilizes your blood sugar levels and it helps rebalance your blood electrolyte levels. They even say that it can help in the preparation of your digestive system. Studies show that dates also boost oxytocin production in your body and they help to speed up the labor process for women who are giving birth. In the Hadith, it records this message. Allah's messenger used to break his fast with fresh dates before going to prayer. And at number one, you probably guessed it, but it is the habit and tradition of prayer. There are many prayers that were personally said by the Prophet Muhammad. There's so many different prayers in different parts of his life for different reasons. But for Muslims, it's said that prayer is more likely to be accepted if it starts with greeting to the Prophet. Prayer is also one of the five pillars of Islam. It is a compulsory requirement for Muslims all around the world. And this is probably one of the most popular or most well-known traditions associated with the Prophet Muhammad and with Muslims in general. So this is why we put it at number one in this episode.